And now I'd like to welcome to the stage Benjamin Backel. Ben, who's going to uh, introduce the next speaker. Ben? Thanks very, thanks very much, Stuart, and, uh, and uh, good morning to everyone on day two of this uh, uh, summit. Um, I'm really, really delighted to announce, uh, without uh, further, ad uh, further ado, um, uh, the Honourable uh, Chris Bowen, uh, Minister for Climate Change and Energy from the Department of Climate Change and Energy, Environment and Water from the Government of Australia, who's kindly taken time from his schedule to come and, and talk to us. Uh, Chris, please come and take the stage. Wherever you have travelled from to be here, we all gather here today on Wurundjeri land, and I acknowledge their unbroken connection to this land for more than 2,000 generations. We acknowledge in the words of the Australian poet Ujuru Nunakul, this land was ours, you may recall, before you came along at all. And of course, this also needs to be acknowledged in the Australian Constitution and we'll have an important chance to do so later this year. In fact, today, the Prime Minister is announcing the opportunity for Australians to do so, to provide a voice to our parliament for our First Peoples, so that no decision is taken about First Nations peoples without consulting with First Nations peoples. And I also want to acknowledge the importance of genuine and constructive consultation and dialogue with traditional owners of our lands and seas on transmission and generation projects and the commitment of my government to ensure that this is genuine engagement. Well, I'm delighted to be here at the inaugural APAC Offshore Wind and Green Hydrogen Summit, the very first of its kind to be held in the Asia-Pacific region. And I'm also glad you've chosen Melbourne, despite today's weather. Because here in Victoria, you have an example of a federal government and a state government working hand in glove in a joint endeavour to develop an offshore wind industry. And I know Minister D'Ambrosio opened the conference yesterday and you'll find our approaches are very aligned. I'm also delighted to be here for a couple of other reasons. I've actually been looking forward to this conference since I first heard Stuart Mullen and David Lenty talking about it on the Offshore Wind podcast several months ago. You see, I am a bit of an offshore wind nerd. Some say I'm just generally a nerd. <laughs> so I am a very loyal listener to the Offshore Wind podcast. And Stuart manages to get a plug in of Australia in every episode. And Stuart, you won't need to work hard on the next episode because I'm sure we're giving you plenty to talk about. And I also am delighted to give you a progress, a progress report on the development of the Australian offshore wind industry, creating a brand new industry from scratch, something not everyone gets the chance to do, but we are, and we're making good progress. We aren't just building an industry from scratch though, we're building an industry in which we want to be a world leader. Now some may say that's an ambitious call for a nation with currently exactly zero offshore wind installations. And it is ambitious, but it's also achievable. We have an until now untapped potential. Potential our government is now harnessing. Australia is the world's largest island, and that comes with a lot of coast and a lot of wind. But it's staggering to look at the charts and see zero next to Australia's current offshore wind installations, especially as your 2022 Global Wind Report found Australia's overall offshore wind potential is estimated at 4,963 gigawatts. Or the 2023 report you launched yesterday notes a pipeline of 50 gigawatts, harnessing a small proportion of that potential will be a, play a significant role in our ambition to become a renewable energy powerhouse. And of course, we know we're part of a much broader and bigger global economic ecosystem. The IEA estimates that renewable energy will provide 98% of the 2,518 terawatt hours of electricity generation to be added between 2022 and 2025. And a lot of this will be wind. It took us, as you know, 40 years to reach one terawatt of installed wind energy capacity this year. The next terawatt will take less than a decade. And as I said, we want to be a part of this picture. 
Let me give you an example of the potential. Now, we all know in this room what a good job the Netherlands is doing on their transition. I was delighted to be there in January and catch up with my good friend Rob Jetton to discuss collaboration on green hydrogen, about which I'll say more in a few minutes. But the Netherlands has a coastline of around 451 kilometres. 451. Australia's coastline is more than 30,000 kilometres. Netherlands has 2,829 megawatts of offshore wind, and Australia has none. So that's why we're developing the framework and capitalising on our potential as a key priority of the Australian Government. Twelve months ago, we announced the first steps in creating a renewable energy industry with the announcement of six proposed regions with world-class offshore wind potential. I've already declared the first two zones, Gippsland and Hunter, and we've begun consultation on the next two zones, Illawarra and Southern Ocean. And today, I'm pleased to announce the next steps. Firstly, the Bass Strait region off the Tasmanian coast. Consultation for this region will start at the beginning of October. And secondly, the final region, the Perth Boundary Zone, off the coast of Western Australia. I announced today that consultation will begin on this zone in November. This puts us firmly, firmly on track to have all six areas declared by the first half of next year. I'm providing this roadmap today because I know it will give industry certainty about the immediate path ahead. It will also give visibility to communities about the conversations that are coming up. And these are important conversations. I heard the Chief Executive talking about the importance of community consultation, and I wholeheartedly agree. Community consultation is critical to our success. It's not a rubber stamp process. It's not a fait accompli. It's a genuine consultation, a genuine conversation, listening to the different perspectives and making sure we get the balance right. In the two zones I've declared so far, Gippsland and Hunter, both have changed from the original zones I put out for consultation. After that consultation, this is as it should be. It's the process working. And I want to say this clearly and frankly to you as well. Our government consultation is better and smoother if proponents have engaged in real, respectful and informed consultations with communities as well. Later this year, Australia's Energy Infrastructure Commissioner will be publishing the first guide for communities and developers on how best to engage in Australia. This will provide more guidance to developers and clearly lay out the process to communities for consultation. We've been able to bring this work forward because of our government's increased investment in the last budget in the development of an Australian offshore wind industry. Australia has some of the best offshore wind resources anywhere in the world and we're pleased to be open for business. But I also want to be clear with you about this. We're interested in renewable energy. We're also interested in jobs, local content and economic development, as well as supply chain diversification. I'm not here to pretend to you that Australia can fulfill all the entire offshore wind, wind supply chain. We can't, but we can fulfill a role increasingly in that supply chain. And we want to see real economic dividends. Proponents with proper plans for economic content Job creation and growth will have the attention and cooperation of the government. And this is especially the case for our regions. Take our first offshore wind zone, for example, Gippsland. It's a couple of hours' drive from here. It's a beautiful part of the world. It's also home to Victoria's coal-fired power stations, power stations that will not be replaced with new ones when they close. So it's no coincidence that we chose Gippsland as our first offshore wind zone. It's rich in wind, we want it to be rich in jobs as well. Not just for existing coal-fired power station workers, but for their kids who want to stay in the region. And offshore wind is an important part of that vision. And I invite offshore wind proponents to really focus on the economic dividend for the regions in which you seek to be located. And when it comes to new industries, of course, our interest doesn't start and end at offshore wind. Offshore wind will be critical to power new industries like green hydrogen. Global demand for renewable hydrogen is growing rapidly, as we know, and is projected to reach 500 million tonnes a year by 2050. And Australia currently hosts 40% of the pipeline of the world's hydrogen projects. And we're proud of that. But we want to see that pipeline reach FID and become a reality. By 2050, Australia's hydrogen in industry could generate 50 billion in additional GDP and create over 16,000 jobs as well as an additional 13,000 jobs from the construction of renewable energy infrastructure to power the production of green hydrogen. It's why we allocated down payment 
of $2 billion towards the Head Start program to create a local hydrogen industry by underwriting some of the world's largest electrolyzer developments. The Head Start is the most significant government investment in Australia's hydrogen industry to date, and a clear and calculable signal of the government's support and determination to grow the industry. Now, we know that the IRA and other initiatives elsewhere means that Australia needs to stay in the game, and that's exactly what we intend to do. We're in a fiercely competitive global landscape for early investment in green hydrogen, and this critical investment keeps Australia in the race to be a global leader. Now, I want to give you an update on where we're at with the Hydrogen Head Start program. We announced the funding in the May budget, and we've been consulting on the design parameters since. We've had very strong engagement on the design of the program from project developers, financiers, industry bodies and engineering firms. We've received 114 written submissions along with 400 participants in workshops in Sydney, Perth and elsewhere and online by my department and Australia's Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA. Now we're still going through the finer detail of each submission but we're very pleased with the response and the early signs indicate that the government's proposed program design is very close to the mark. Industry is broadly happy with the approach and most of the proposed specifications were well received. The industry uh, highlighted the effect that the US Inflation Reduction Act's funding model has had on the developing projects in Australia and we recognise that that is very real. We've heard clearly the preference for a shorter, sharper expressions of interest process while allowing more time for full applications to firm up off-take applications and project financing. And I've also heard clearly that complex hydrogen projects will need flexibility through the assessment process and over time to manage changes such as volume, uh, production volumes. With the consultation program period now complete, the government is working to refine the design of the program before I intend to open funding applications later this year. Now again, this is a regional story. A big part of Australia's competitive offering in green hydrogen is not in our cities, but in our regions. A ready-to-go workforce and adaptable infrastructure, which has been powering the world for so long and is ripe for renewable investment. We have regions with enormous potential to make and produce green hydrogen. For example, the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Now, just as Gippsland was our first offshore wind zone, the Hunter is our first green hydrogen hub. It has a vein of coal mines running through it. It's a very traditional coal town. But the local community is in transition as the shift to renewables gains momentum. Our government's actively supporting these regions in transition and a new federal agency has been set up with this task, the Net Zero Authority. With a resource presence comes heavy industry and clear opportunities to decarbonise. So for example, we're investing $70 million in the Hunter Valley Hydrogen Hub with Origin Energy and Orica to use hydrogen to decarbonise ammonia manufacturing, heavy vehicles and public transport. We're investing $100 million to upgrade and support the Port of Newcastle's Hydrogen Readiness Program. It is the largest coal export port in the world, but it's transitioning and establishing a clean energy precinct with a shared infrastructure for hydrogen and ammonia production, storage and shipping. And we're also working with the New South Wales Government and engineering experts, Arup, to understand the broader opportunities to develop a green hydrogen ecosystem in the Hunter, including by leveraging the potential of the Hunter Pro Power Project and other new hydrogen projects. Our regions are at the heart of our renewable generation story and, that they, and they will be at the heart of global renewable investment. So I've spoken a lot today about what the Australian Government is doing, not just to catch up to the pack, but to lead it. I'll be very honest with you. Australia is a bit like the kid who forgot to study early in the exam process <laughs> and is now pulling all-night study sessions to catch up. <laughs> we have started our renewable transformation very late, but we're now working 24-7 to catch up. We're acutely aware of the challenges, including supply chain, workforce and social licence. But we also know that our natural advantages in critical minerals and strategic manufacturing will play an important role in uh, not just importing key components, but building more and more of them here as well. We're investing heavily in renewables as a government, but the bulk of the capital needed will come from the private sector. Hence, we're building a stable and warmly welcoming policy environment for renewable investment. And we need you. 
We need your capital, we need your investment, we need your experience. And we can provide our resources, our natural advantage, and our highly skilled workforce. If I left you with one message today, I want it to be this. The Australian Government is deadly serious about our journey to become a renewable energy superpower. And we want to partner with you to make it a reality. We've made a good start, but there's so much more to do. So together, let's get on with it. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Minister. Um, it's almost kind of like a dream for GWEC to have someone who describes themselves as an offshore wind uh, nerd um, in a ministerial position. So I can't say how happy I am uh, about that. Um, now, when did you decide, you know, let's do this? You know, this is really something that Australia can do. Um, and when you travel around the different regions of Australia, how do you tra transmit that enthusiasm to a public which you know, has probably never even heard of offshore wind. How do you get people bought into this? Mm. Well, I think we're all on that journey. I mean, I, I, I bought in very early in my period as the Shadow Minister, um, when I was Shadow Minister early. And frankly, there was a delegation that came to see me of unions and industry leaders who pointed out to me that we had no offshore wind industry. And it, the case just made such compelling sense. And so we got on board and we pushed the previous government to do more. And then when we won office last May, really tried to supercharge the agenda. And um, yes, I do have this conversation with the regions, and, and you're right, it's something so new in Australia. It does take a lot of communication and consultation. You know, um, you can predict the concerns, and, and they're concerns that do need to be addressed. Whale migration, offshore fishing, recreational fishing, commercial fishing. I'm sure there are very similar issues around the world when new zones are being proposed, bird life, etc. But if you have that conversation openly and respectfully and say, yes, these are issues that need to be worked through, but here's all the massive opportunities for our country. In many instances, as I said, you know, your coal fire power station is going to be closing over the next 10 years. We need to create new jobs for you and your community. This is a good way of doing it. I often say, you know, offshore wind is energy rich, but it's also jobs which rich because the turbines move so fast and need more maintenance. That means they need more workers. Because the turbines are offshore, you need ships to take the workers out. That's shipping jobs, it's port jobs. Communities get that, and that's the message that I give them. I mean, over the last 20, 30 years, the climate issue in Australia has been pretty polarised. You know, mm. with, with you know, a series of governments taking different positions, mm. uh, some you know, high amount of polarisation in, in the press and a fair dose of disinformation. Um, how much is the conversation now you know, about economics and jobs, and how much is it about climate these days? Well, it's, it's about both, and that was, I don't want to be too partisan, but that was uh, our offering at the last election. We said, and this was the big change, we said, yes, acting on climate change is a global responsibility. It's a responsibility for future generations. We absolutely have to do it as a moral obligation. But even if it wasn't, we should do it anyway, because it's an economic opportunity for our country. And that's the big change. And increasingly in the regions, people have gotten that. So if you walked in, I'll be very frank, if you went to a, a Queensland town five years ago, as we used to, and talked about green hydrogen or wind, you, people weren't paying attention. But now as it gets closer, people can see tangibly the job opportunities and they can also see the old industries changing. Regions are very much now as part of that conversation. So that's been a big change as well. So it's that shift to the, yes, it's a moral obligation, but even if it wasn't, you know, we have, met, we have the best renewable opportunities in the world. We would be mad not to harness them. Yeah. Now, moving on to, to APAC and Asia and the APAC region, where, where do you see Australia really having kind of leadership opportunities there, particularly around supply chain, but also around the kind of skills that Australia has, um, and also around you know, shipping, logistics. You know, where, where the, where's the, the real strength for Australia there? Well, I, I mean, I think it is really assisting countries in our region with their transition. And everybody's at a different part of the journey. So take Singapore, for example, very good friend of Australia. You know, uh, a government which uh, does have climate ambition. But the one thing renewable energy needs, we could all agree, is space. You need room. The one thing Singapore doesn't have is room. Um, so they need help. So, you know, here we are developing Australia's largest solar farm, 24 million solar panels, to be connected 
with Singapore. Um, that's one opportunity. Uh, I went to Japan and Korea earlier uh, this year, couple of, a month or so ago, and talked to them about our role. They are big customers of our gas, and you know we will remain reliable suppliers, but we want to help them on their transition. You know, and I was saying very openly and frankly in my meetings in Tokyo and Seoul, we are here to help you with your transition, and you know, you can only make so much hydrogen yourself. We are here to assist you. So I think that's our main role. It's in our own interest, but it's also in the interest of our region. Yeah, maybe one, one, one last one on, on supply chain. I mean, obviously you want uh, manufacturing jobs. You know, you've talked about the, the, the opportunities for the regions. I mean, you know, in the world that we're at, uh, in the world that we're in at the moment, um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, giving a very strong incentive to manufacturing there, other countries moving to, to, to duplicate it. You know, how far are you prepared to go in Australia to incentivise you know, industrial um, um, investment? And also, mm -hmm. between the regions, you know, how do you ensure there's kind of collaboration on supply chain? Um, you mean the broader region? Uh, no, I mean between the um, Australian regions. How, right. do you, how do you ensure, you know, obviously, a healthy degree of competition yeah. between... Uh, regions, but also making sure there's a, a, a supply chain which can operate across the whole of Australia and yeah. the region. Well, I think it's all part of the same process. So yes, we are leaning in because we want to make renewable energy and we want to make the things that make renewable energy. You know, being realistic about our role in global supply chain, but doing more. So we have various mechanisms and levers to do that. We have the um, National Reconstruction Fund, which is a $15 billion fund our government has set up. Uh, for co-investment, with three billion of that set aside for renewable energy, and another billion set aside for critical minerals processing, co-investment, making projects more uh, more viable earlier. Uh, we also have various regional programs. We have a, a national battery manufacturing precinct. We have various green hydrogen hubs. The Hunter's the first, but there are more coming. So really, it is spreading across the regions as well. Internationally, though, I mean, we have the view that we want to make more things, but we want other countries making more things too. Uh, we want to diversify supply chains. So um, we recently announced, and um, uh, it's perhaps a little bit of an unusual announcement, but an important one, a $50 million investment, modest, but, but still meaningful, $50 million investment to encourage renewable manufacturing in the region, in countries in the Indo-Pacific, to get in with early R&D and assist companies developing because we want to make more things here, but we want India making more things, we want Indonesia making more things, we want to diversify supply chain. And probably the main international forum we discuss is, is the Quad. So there's a Quad Energy Ministers, it's Australia, India, Japan and the United States. There's a Quad Energy Ministers group and really all the four energy ministers talk about is supply chain. How do we work together to diversify supply chain? And you know we have various programs, and the fifty million dollar investment was part of that. So that's the main way we progress it internationally. Uh, that's very interesting, and, and I think that's a good segue to my, my final question. Um, we first met in Egypt in Sharm El Sheikh uh, about a year ago, mm. and um, we talked about the Global Offshore Wind Alliance. And um, in in really lightning time, uh, you were able to get Australia uh, to join the alliance, and uh, we, which we launched at, at, at COP uh, twenty seven. Um, what role do you think the Alliance can play um, in developing offshore wind and, and collaboration? And well, we're, we're very happy to be members and you know, very happy that Victoria has joined as well. Um, and uh, I see it really as, as mainly information sharing and, and, and uh, skills and learning sharing on this remarkable journey that we're all on. And we're not going to get it all right all the time. And when you're engineering a new industry as part of the broader picture, of the biggest economic change our country has undertaken in modern times, you know, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is a faster, more meaningful change than any economic change we've ever undertaken, including the post-war rebuilding of the Australian economy. Uh, in seven years, really, effectively, by 2030, or as I like to say, 76 months. Um, it's remarkably fast, and we're not gonna do it alone. And we all need to learn from each other and collaborate. And I think the Alliance is an excellent way of doing that. Minister, thank you very much. Please put your hands thank together you. for, for Minister Bowe.